Hi. Welcome. We're on Autism Talk Television. I'm your host, Alex Plank. And this week we have author um, and quadricopter expert Jack Robeson. What have I written? Um, nothing really, but your dad wrote a book. Why don't you explain what that is? <laughs> We're here talking about a new, really cool technology called TMS. Jack, why don't you explain what TMS is and what it stands for? Okay. Uh, TMS stands for Transcranial Magnetic Stimulation. Uh, and basically they, uh, using focus, focused magnetic fields, can induce electrical activity in specific regions of your brain and uh, affect functionality. I recently sat down with Lindsay Overman and interviewed her about the study. And after her interview, you will get to see me undergoing TMS myself. My name is Dr. Lindsay Overman, and I am an instructor at Harvard Medical School. And I work at the Barents and Allen Center for Non-Invasive Brain Stimulation at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center. I um, have a PhD in experimental psychology and I've been working uh, here at the center uh, studying brain plasticity in individuals with autism spectrum disorders. I was first drawn to autism uh, in, as an undergraduate student. Uh, I worked with lots of uh, individuals with autism, also with um, schizophrenia and some other disorders. And it really amazed me that um, in all the years that we've known about these disorders, that still now today in 2010, we really have a very uh, superficial idea of really what leads to autism uh, and other disorders of the brain. And uh, was just really amazed of the, the functioning of the brain and how, um, how little we know about how the brain functions and how dysfunctions of the brain lead to um, mental disorders. Thanks, Lindsay. Could you please explain TMS for those of us who aren't familiar with the technology? So TMS stands for Transcranial Magnetic Stimulation. It's this machine right here. And um, it basically, what we do is we place a magnetic coil on top of your scalp and um, transcranial, meaning it goes through your head, through the cranium, if you will. Magnetic, so it uses a magnetic pulse, magnetic field, and stimulation. It's gonna stimulate the brain. And basically what happens is you have this very strong magnetic field that induces an electrical current in the brain, and this electrical current in the brain is what activates that brain tissue. So the brain actually um, runs naturally through electrical potentials. So by putting in an electrical current into the brain, we can actually get it to respond. Great. So how does this apply to autism? And what are the goals of your study? The primary goal of our studies is to characterize um, the brain mechanisms that lead to autism spectrum disorders. We believe that studying brain plasticity will help us to understand what is the underlying brain mechanism that is responsible for these types of disorders. So that's our primary goal. However, our long-term goal um, if we can identify mechanisms that are um, abnormal in the brain of individuals with um, autism spectrum disorders, then we can begin to develop treatments that actually target these brain mechanisms. And in doing so, we don't have to wait until a behavioral symptom occurs. We could treat it preemptively in a young child if we see that this brain is starting to develop these types of um, aberrant plasticity. Also, we can start to develop treatments for, for older individuals who already have the behavioral disorder that might reverse some of the symptoms. Interesting. So what are the consequences of hyperplasticity in an autistic brain? 
So brain plasticity is your brain's ability to change connections. So throughout development, that's how circuits get set up in your brain. It's how different regions get connected to each other, is that each time an, an environmental stimulus uh, comes into your brain, whether it be from vision or, or hearing or um, uh, sensation, then um, a, a, the brain processes that information then the uh, brain will start to develop circuits that can process this type of information. And uh, throughout development, these circuits get changed and modified. And that's how you learn and that's how you develop. But if you're changing and modifying these connections too often or too readily, then these circuits don't get solidified in the way that they should. They're too changeable, they're too malleable. So. Um, it's as if, I describe it as if um, you're in a big city with a whole bunch of side roads and there's not any big strong highways to get you from point A to point B. So instead, you have to go from point A to Q, R, S, and T before ever getting to B because you have to take these sort of um, not as strong, not as big connections in the brain. Um, autism results in um, aberrant connections in the brain that um, too many connections in some cases that can lead to a lot of the deficits that we see in these children um, and adults. So uh, for example, it can lead to um, brains that are more prone to epilepsy and we know that children with autism um, have a greater chance of developing epilepsy. Um, it can also lead to delays in certain processing of complex information like language and or social skills that require communication between large areas of the brain. So it's not just that language is in one little area. We know that language is processed throughout the brain. So if you to send a signal all across the brain and that signal is not, the, the points where it needs to get sent to and from are not well connected because there's a whole lot of other connections, then um, you end up leading to uh, a delay in these types of processing. So how would a researcher go about stimulating a brain using TMS? So there's lots of different types of stimulation. Um, and depending on what uh, protocol you use, you can either activate a brain region or you can deactivate a brain region. And you can lead to activation that is sustained for long periods of time, or you can activate it for just a, a smaller period of time. I see. So which forms of stimulation are you using in this study? Most of the protocols that we use for um, our studies to look at brain plasticity is called theta burst stimulation. And theta burst stimulation basically it involves five bursts in a second, which is how it got its name of the theta frequency. So it, it has five pulses in a se five bursts of pulses in a second. And this um, this pattern of stimulation is actually mimics the pattern of firing in the brain when somebody is naturally changing around their brain circuitry. So when you're learning a task, your brain will fire in this theta frequency. And when a mouse, let's say, is learning a maze, its brain will fire in this theta frequency. So we think that this theta frequency is actually very important for changing the connectivity of the brain. What is the possible role of TMS as a treatment for autism? TMS itself has um, been used in other disorders um, for a treat as a treatment. So for example, it's currently FDA approved for depression. So there's a specific protocol that they use for depression that um, the TMS machine can actually increase mood. Um, and so they've, they've used it on a lot of different individuals uh, with um, intractable depression that they can't um, get under control with medications, for example. So um, TMS could potentially be used in the future as a treatment for um, autism or Asperger's syndrome. Um, but it also could be used as a index, a measure of how effective other drugs are. So if you begin to develop, uh, say, a drug that 
individuals think will be beneficial for um, people with autism and Asperger syndrome. And you want to see does what is it changing in the brain? What what is the mechanism by which this drug is working? You can use TMS to see if in fact this drug is changing the hyperplasticity that we see in individuals with um, autism and Asperger syndrome. If their plasticity is beginning to look more like a neurotypical, then perhaps this drug is is targeting that mechanism. How does TMS compare to other technologies we're more familiar with, like an MRI? TMS is really unique um, in that we can actually affect the brain. We don't just observe. A lot of the brain imaging tools that are out there, like MRI and EEG, are observational techniques. They put people in, the, the, for example, the MRI scanner, and you look at the brain, but you can't really change its activity. You just say, this was the activity when the person was doing such and such a task. With TMS, you can actually affect the brain and look at the change that results. And so um, some interesting things that we found as a result of this is that the brain in individuals with autism spectrum disorders is quite different than a neurotypical brain. And for example, we see that um, regions of the brain that uh, are involved in certain behaviors such as language skills or facial expression recognition in neurotypical individuals um, do not function the same way as in individuals with Asperger's syndrome. Okay, so I hope you guys enjoyed that interview, but there's more. I actually went to Harvard Medical School and took place in the study, and we filmed it. So stay tuned for a behind-the-scenes look at what TMS actually is. Um, yeah, we're all set with that. Okay. Um, check to see what's the best place, location, and the best amplitude to stimulate your brain at. So um, Fritz will just going to be um, clicking around and looking. Before we do that, though, give me just a second. I want to do two things. I want to get you some earplugs, and I want to get you a towel to rest your hand on. Okay. So this just um, gives you something to rest on. So the most important thing is for you to keep your hand just totally relaxed. Just this hand, I can do whatever. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can do whatever. Can I, can I do those? Yep, yep, of course. So there, you just break them apart, and then you just twist them up, stick them in. And they kind of poof up inside. Oh, you know what? Also, we need to give you the glasses. So I'm going to have <laughs> you take off your glasses. Uh-oh. But you don't have to look at anything. I mean, you don't have to read Okay, it, right? I, I didn't know that I needed glasses until I was, like, in middle school. And I realized that the only reason I got, like, perfect scores on the vision test is because I was somehow able to guess correctly on most of the letters. Huh. I think the first one's E. Yeah, right. <laughs> well, and, and, and most Take of them were, glasses? like, you, you say which direction they go anyway. Yeah. All right, so I'm just going to put these on, try to get them... As comfortable as you as Can I wear can. these on my date? <laughs> <laughs> you could. I really? think that she I'm might to think take them. that. Do you, how many thoughts do you have on yours, Fritz? One? Yeah, one are showing. Yeah, okay. Okay. I'm just taking these so that. Well, we want this to be as snug so it doesn't move, but not like painful. We don't want it to be like uncomfortable. For an excuse.
Hey, look at that. We're close to hour two of the stimulation. So far, all that has occurred is that as my finger has moved. <laughs> and then we have seven minute breaks. Um. Alright, so there you have it uh, from the mouth of a researcher uh, at Harvard, what TMS actually means to her and the importance and significance it has in, in terms of autism. Now Jack, why don't you explain what your personal experience is because we didn't get any clips of you uh, at the experiment. Yeah, I, I couldn't be there the day that uh, you guys were filming there, but uh, I've taken part in the TMS study uh, at Harvard Medical for uh, quite a while myself actually and uh, have done TMS quite a few times in different regions and um, there was one region in particular that uh, had a, a sort of a profound effect I guess that um, and it produced a, 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 a also a profound effect to my father that uh, he's talked about um, and to me what it did was it uh, I'm not entirely sure how long it lasted but it it fundamentally changed my, I guess, my, my perception of sound and uh, light. That uh, I've sort of always thought of myself as having, you know, normal vision, and I see colors, and I, you know, see things the way a normal person does. But um, after TMS, um, it wasn't as if I was seeing new colors, but I was just seeing a much sort of broader range of colors that I was, you know, distinguishing the differences between different shades of red and different, you know, shades of green and blue that I, before, I guess, I, I just wouldn't have noticed. Um, and that was a, a very noticeable effect that had happened that just, you know, walking around in Boston, just, you know, everything was very bright and very colorful. Um, also, it, it made uh, the way that I hear sound almost like uh, each separate sound source was its own, like, channel. And... Uh, so instead of just hearing, you know, a, a mix of sounds, like walking down the street and you hear, you know, taxis and cars driving by and people talking and people walking by, it's normally, you know, just like a, a mash of sound. And then if you're focusing on something, if you're talking to somebody, then you hear them too, but there's that background noise. But for that little while, it was as if, you know, each one was its own track. And so I remember listening, just walking through Boston and, you know, listening to, you know, that taxi as it drives by and, and you know, being able to pick the taxi's sound out of the rest of the noise with like, absolutely no problem. And it was a, a very uh, sort of, sort of uh, obvious change. Because I also remember uh, listening to uh, a chorus singing in the, on the radio on the way back from Boston and being able to count the different singers in the chorus, which is something that I would not normally be able to do. Wow. So That is quite profound. All right, folks. Well, there you have it. TMS a hands-on experience. Tune in next week because we will have part two of our Famous Toys episode where we interview a creator of something pretty cool. Yeah. <laughs> well, there you have it, folks. Goodbye.